My name is Frans Hoijmeer and I'm an associate professor at the TU Delft uh, University in the Department of Urbanism and uh, for the SARC project as an academic partner together with three other institutes we of course uh, study the pilots and try to uh, consolidate what is learned into uh, something that's replicable and in work package one we're looking at an implementation framework. Um, for this we had a proposition of a framework what you need to do to be able to have an appropriate design of nature-based solutions in urban coastal towns and uh, this proposition is tested in Vlissingen and in South on Sea and we're basically using the other pilots to learn uh, from to uh, to uh, to uh, to improve basically uh, our framework I'm gonna uh, explain to you about this uh, with the case of South End on Sea, and I'm using our Miro board uh, that we use as a team to uh, have workshops in, uh, and I'm taking you uh, through that because Miro also has a um, as an uh, presentation mode. Um, let's see, we go here. It's my computer. I think I filled it up too much. It's a bit slow. Um, but uh, this is it. Yeah. Um, so basically what you see on the my report is that we uh, do analysis. Uh, we take a step together. We do more analysis. We take a step together. And uh, that's how the whole process go. And this also coincides quite uh, well with uh, uh, with the with the setup of our of our framework and the steps that we're having uh, we're taking that we proposed, which is on the right side. So you need to be able to understand the long durée, so the long historical lines and qualities to take them into the future, uh, to be able to have an appropriate uh, design proposal. Then you of course have the urban project uh, within this. What is actually uh, the contemporary issues? Uh, you have to prioritize then you can develop different strategies and then connect them to measures so this is what we've been doing for both pilots in Flissing and south end on sea and our main uh, concern is really how you can uh, integrate uh, coastal engineering with urban development with uh, nature that's the green uh, the green arrow here because uh, flood defense is now a line an infrastructure project but uh, yeah, if you really want to consider the natural system, you could you you have to move away from the line and see it as a zone, as a coastal zone, because in the urban area behind the line there are also environmental issues. There's also something like pluvial flooding in both cases uh, that needs to be addressed. So we are really trying to uh, take this out of uh, an infrastructure project, which has a quite a simple cost benefit uh, business case. Uh, to an urban project, urban area development, which is a bit more uh, complicated. So and this is what we're doing here is really test this um, test this approach in the pilot of South End on Sea. I must say it's an academic uh, trial trial because the pilot in itself for the project consists out of interventions, nature based solution interventions at the coast at the coastal uh, line at the at the front. But um, yeah, we really wanted to uh, to position these solutions in a in a longer term and lar and larger strategy for the town. And this is what we are been. And and in that sense, we are really testing how to integrate information from the Maritime Archaeological Trust, which is a partner. Uh, well, the long durée connected also to the urban history, the urban developments, what is needed in that in in South End on Sea, what are the issues at hand. And, 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 and flood risk management. And these are my colleagues at civil engineering. They are modeling, they have mod, made a model, build a model of uh, South End on Sea, and we're basically testing uh, measures uh, in this model. So it's really a combination of design and assess, and design and assess, go back and forth. This is what we also think is necessary. So after the preliminary anal analysis of uh, the, the area, the pilots, we did the problem discovery and the problem definition together. What are we really looking at together? Which is, of course, limited. We're not looking at everything. Uh, and also solutions that we from our different fields are looking at. Uh, and, and combining these uh, solutions uh, ended up in the concept validation, what we were thinking, what we were going to talk about, translated in this long-term strategy on the scale of the whole front. 
And this long-term strategy had four important uh, drivers. The long durée aspect, so uh, well, we're in a dynamic ghost. It's been dynamic, it will be dynamic in the future. Um, and we really need to include these dynamics into uh, making plans for the future of this town uh, in combination with archaeological finding and meaning of the humans that were there before and will come after. Uh, second is the topo aspect. So if you look into flood, if you want to work with nature into a flood defense, then of course the height of the land is very important because some areas are more vulnerable than others. You really should connect this into your urban development um, and densities, for example. Uh, so high zones uh, are, are not suffering from coastal flooding, but pluvial flooding, also an issue at hand. Uh, you can accept water coming in uh, into green areas and uh, basically reduce the consequences of water coming in. But that means that you don't, do not have to uh, raise your uh, fronts. So then you move to, uh, to, to, uh, to um, accepting the water and living with it, uh, which is also a quality. You can resist, of course, to use gray infrastructure or advances that you basically build outside of the dike. Then the eco aspects, obviously, in this project is crucial and is also meant for the strategy that we said. It's not just coast, it's not just nature based solutions at the coast, but also up behind. It's, it's, it's one big uh, natural system that you should consider as a driver for your uh, project. And accessibility was important in South End because it's um, a, um, a touristic town, so there's a lot of coaches, etc., uh, coming in. Um, so this for the whole front, uh, you can see that we then defined strategic areas and then we chose for uh, Schuberninas to really develop this into uh, a design, uh, which meant that there was more analysis and more about uh, well, the models actually on this scale and interaction and that there was strategy development uh, for this uh, smaller uh, scale um, area which at the moment is looked at by project developers to fill it in with uh, housing or to even build their new uh, small harbor or port, I don't know. Uh, so here you can see that we are we're looking into, uh, well, if you accept, if you don't do anything to this dike, then in certain storms, the water will come over. And if you then really remodel the landscape in such a way that the water will remain there, then there's basically no consequences in death or damage. Um, so here you see the different uh, spatial analysis to be able to propose the design, which is here. Uh, so the, these designs were also modeled uh, every time by our hydraulic engineers to really um, understand where the water would go over time. There you can see here sort of time sequences. So if you have no action, the water will come here. Um, and we propose to remodel the landscape in such a way that you retain the water inside this area and at the same time create new natural uh, areas or it is already and you basically preserve the natural area but you can enhance it um, and as uh, John nicely pointed out in the last session that also Gary of the Maritime Archaeological Trust found that there's a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, natural uh, trees or that, well, uh, say, I don't know the English word now, the trees and plants that used to be there uh, could be reused in redesigning this area and bring them back and basically renature it into its original ecosystem. But at the same time, you can also uh, include property development that is very special living with this uh, water, waterly condition. So it's uh, about a new paradigm in uh, accepting uh, uh, water coming in, creating basically a very nice natural and also uh, uh, inhabitable uh, area. Uh, we, this is the step we're at now that we're looking into more specific public space design. So here you can see this is then the new border of the area where you can put in real estate, where you do have to remodel the land safety with a soil close balance. balance you can uh, make deeper basins to really uh, keep the water there, but also to redesign uh, the buffer zone with this uh, original plants and trees that's supposed to be there, or the inner dike principle where you can also include archaeological findings as a part of your design. And the dike principle is well how you're going to uh, remodel the dike. It has to be heightened, I think, a little bit to uh, not have too much water going in, but um, um, yeah, the, the, the aim here, if you talk about Mrs. models, is of course that if you 
only uh, if you now would only um, enhance the safety by raising the dike. It's an infrastructure project, uh, which is of course quite clear cut and simple. But what you see here is that of course by taking it in a, as a larger area and develop uh, uh, more uh, urban amenities that it would also lead to effects on the longer term that uh, are impacting uh, well more happy people, uh, uh, more healthy nature, uh, which are more long term uh, effects that uh, uh, are maybe not taking into a business case uh, as such, but uh, are very important to really change your thinking about it. And of course, uh, well, putting in new real estate in this area could also be a funding option. All this said, this is an academic exercise. So in that sense, I think, well, John can explain more that uh, that maybe as a as a way of approaching uh, flood defense for the municipality, this is an example. And we, of course, hope to present this to them and inspire them to uh, really take this into also their urban development plans. So this is it for now. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, so as Franz was saying, this is sort of an academic exercise, but then th what we'll do now is we're going to start engaging internal stakeholders, um, people like strategic planners to hopefully get this inputted into the local plan for the area um, and make it a long term strategic option for the area. Um, we've had a few interesting questions come up. Um, so we've got Grant and Ruby. I've got questions and there's another one coming in. So Rob, do you want to field the questions for me? Oh, hello Rob. And we've got, uh, who's that with a hand up as well? Um, sorry, bear with me one second. Um, Stuart, Stuart Hunter, would you like to demute and ask a question? Hi, yep. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, really interesting. Um, I work for the Environment Agency. I'm in the National Agriculture team at the, at the moment, but with links to FCRM, and learning more about it in Devon and Cornwall. Um, it's, I guess it's easier, or for me anyway, my, with my experience, to see that nature-based solutions for fluvial flooding and sort of holding water back from coming downstream, it seems very obvious for coastal coastal situations then it doesn't seem quite as obvious to me because I, I guess well not not that it's not quite as obvious but there, there often isn't much space is what I think is in certain situations so it's harder to do um, so I was really interested to see your sort of managed retreat but in the new basins um, the basins there already that did you propose in or would it would it require demolishing of, of properties and areas and if so, I guess, how do you think that would go down with the discussions with the... No, this this area is actually, um, it's almost like a wildlife area. Um, there are certain uh, developers who want to do certain things in the area. Uh, one of the ideas that's been bounced around by developers is actually want to rip down the seawall and turn it into a marina. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And another, another idea is uh, further back where you look at the rear basin, um, that's land that's earmarked for development. There is already a planning application put in to put in uh, flats, houses, restaurants, businesses there, um, which was actually vetoed by the Environment Agency because at the current state, the area is only protected against an 80 year event. OK, so it's a, it'll be a real balance then to try and make the space for nature yep. in that scenario. But I guess any Plus assessment is better. Yeah. There's also a lot of history in the area. So if we're looking at doing stuff with the sea wall in this area, mm -hmm. um, we had during the Second World War, this area was a quick fire battery and part of the coastal defence for the Thames. Right. So there's also uh, munitions in the area. There's all sorts of things going on. And also on the actual seawall itself, there's uh, protected archaeological parts of the defences for the UK back in the Second World War. Right. <laughs> okay, so cha it, yeah, a very challenging place to work. Yeah. Yep. And then the development that's to, if you look at the picture here, 
the development where you have the lake area and beyond that is um, all listed buildings dating back to uh, the garrison that's now a residential development but they're all listed buildings as part of the 18th century garrison at Shubriness. Crikey. <laughs> okay yeah yes it's uh it's going to take huge a huge change in mindset isn't it for people yeah. to move and also forward to this in terms topic. of developing this area you've got badgers you've got munitions you've got uh archaeological evidence dating back to neolithic and paleolithic times so this area has always been occupied okay thank you for that <laughs> complex well, in that sense, it's also a chance, eh? because uh, uh, yeah, by by making it a, a a sort of overtopping sump area where you where you accept the water uh, without without it damaging anything, because the whole area is designed to uh, to welcome this water. You yeah. also have somehow a reason to, uh, and it will not happen. It will only happen once every hundred years or something. You have a reason also to well to keep it uh, green and uh, to 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 give way to nature and 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 historical meaning. So uh, yeah, in that sense, I think it it could also be helpful to somehow uh, help support this paradigm change towards living with the water instead of just defending ourselves from it. Yeah, it's the same as reconnecting rivers with their floodplains, really. Exactly, yeah. And this is, of course, also uh, good for the pluvial flooding and the fluvial flooding. So in that sense, this is also accepting water coming from uh, the, the, the urban area when there is a, a big rainstorm. Yes. OK, thank you. And not to know, I mean, at the top of this area, you've got an industrial estate and then just past that, you've actually got one of the main railways in the area as well. So if you do nothing, and this area floods, it will affect a large amount of infrastructure. Uh, right, let's have a look at the chat box. What else have we got? Um, Chris, uh, the National Team for the Environment Agency, specialising in natural flood management. Do you have a question? Hi everyone. No, nothing in particular. I just thought I'd introduce myself. I'm uh, just interested to, to to see the case studies and not surprised at the complexity of competing interests, which which occurs everywhere, in rural areas as well as urban areas. Um, and and I, I think I was in the the previous breakout session on stakeholder approaches and um, our learning from the natural flood management program. I think I was um, is that 60 to 70 percent of the costs for lots of nature based solution schemes are in uh, communications, engagement and stakeholder working. And um, there there's no way around that. And if you try and shortcut, you end up with failed projects. Yeah, very interesting learnings there. So basically it's changing hearts and minds as much as you're using nature yeah and you're, you're dealing with a whole series of cultural baggage around uh, the fact that humans have modified and changed the natural environment to to uh, protect ourselves since since civilizations began and now we're asking people to change that perception very quickly and uh, it, it can't happen overnight no, I mean, that's why we did the study as part of this as the long durée. So Gary looked up back to about 9000 years ago and examined uh, old maps. He looked at old artworks and basically put those against the current current environment versus the old environment to teach people. That actually, this coastline has been stable for thousands of years and it's only really become a problem. Now we've started messing with it. <laughs> I would char characterize it as a uh, St. George versus St. Francis and the two of them are two of them are competing. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, got a question from Grant. So yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I was just uh, really interesting talk. I was just wondering, um, obviously, with a project like this, it can be difficult to to 
keep developers and things like that at bay, but obviously it's, it's generally down to the local authority to make a decision on what to do with that land. So I was just wondering if it's maybe a bit too in detail, but are there any plans to an intention to kind of increase community use of this area? Because it's often a good way to implement schemes like this, if you can get buy-in from the community. Yeah, them. so the idea is basically we're looking at this area and sort of um, increasing the areas around it using soft measures, almost like brass dikes. And then the idea would be to look at the historical plants in the area. And also down the road from this area was um, a scheduled ancient monument for the Danish camp where the Danes invaded England and had a fortress there. So we'd tie into the previous history and then make it sort of like a, a feature piece for the area. So that way we'd engage the local community and let them know, look, this is your green space to use. These are the plants that used to be here. This is all the history in the area. Um, so it's as much around protecting nature and protecting archaeology as well. Yeah. So by not okay. developing yeah. the area, you're actually protecting the history of the area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like that's quite a good opportunity to, you know, to, to really sort of push forward to the to the community. You know, there's a lot of heritage in this area that, that we're also looking to protect and to, to kind of bring that to the forefront um, as something to be enjoyed. Yeah, the only problem is developers. <laughs> yeah. Big one. Yeah. So, I mean, the idea of this, I mean, you can see there at the back there, there's some little houses. Um, those would be, if you were to develop the area, those would be uh, based on a Dutch model where you have them on stilts. So you have parking underneath the houses and then flats on top. Yeah. Okay. Sort of adaptation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, we have Suzanne who's typing something. Um, Suzanne, feel free to demute and actually ask a physical question yourself. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I was just, I had two thoughts. The one was about communications and I've got secondary aged kids myself. So it just struck me that some of the data and PowerPoint, well, it's not really PowerPoint, Miro information would be brilliant if, if that would be fed into the local secondary school somehow. And if that's something that was being done? Or um, be done? So what we're doing is we've built up a school education program as part of one of the work packages. Uh, and we're also building a visualization toolkit. So that can then be presented to local communities of all ages. Um, so they can learn A, about the history of the area and B, about what nature-based solutions can bring and how the benefits can affect them moving forwards. That sounds brilliant. Are we able to see um, anything that's been done so far? Is that a work in progress, I take it? It is a work in progress. Um, I think. Bear with us. Um, if you go <laughs> onto the SARC website, there'll be a link there soon in the next couple of months that will actually take you to the visualisation tool. OK, thank you. And the other thought I had was only we went to um, Western Supermare over the summer holidays and they've got a marine park or something and there seem to be issues with the water quality so you said something about marine i'm looking on my phone and i can hardly see the picture so i don't know if you covered it or or not or i imagine that would have to be properly designed so i don't know if you had any more thoughts about that it's just um our thoughts is basically to go back to the local planners and the developers and say this is a really bad idea there's never okay. been a marina here why are you putting a marina when there never was one <laughs> okay that's probably a good thing. Thanks. Uh, I've got a question from Kevin. Go ahead. Kevin. Hello. Um, yeah, just looking at your um, your uh, houses on on stilts. Um, how, how does that fit in with the with the MPPF and the requirement for uh, developments to be safe? Would there be a, an escape route provided for those for those properties? Because that would be one of the questions. And. How does that, if a developer is, or, or if that's or, or that area has already been identified in a local plan for development, um, how does that rest with developers and and the age-old argument of viability? Um, putting them on stilts does that increase the cost, and therefore do you get um, is there a likelihood for the developer to come back and say, well, actually that's too expensive, we're not doing that, therefore uh, it's not viable. Of course there is. Um, Francie, do you want to zoom out and show us the example? 
Um, one of the slides I've actually got under solutions, I believe, um, what the actual houses on stilts look like. And the stilts are actually literally kind of like a parking garage area like you'd have on sort of semi-normal developments anyway. Yeah. Um, and then you'd probably link it like TU Delft would have in their campus with walkways. So you'd have exactly you you all are connected to dry land so you are all you can always leave you just have another uh, another environment but you're talking about solutions uh move further across uh, where are we uh, a bit further across to the right please yeah. uh, oh here is it there is it here yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, there. Yeah. No, that's not it. That's the current ones. Oh, that's the current um, one. Further to the right again. And... Sorry, keep going a bit more to the right. <laughs> we'll get there eventually. There, in there. Right where your finger, right where your mouse is. There. Here? Here. Mm. Zoom in and then down a bit. There you go. Oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. So as you see, under section four, floodable areas, parts, squares, parking lots and housing, you can see they look like normal housing, but they're actually designed so if the area floods, you lose your car. Now, you know that it will flood, so you take your car out. Huh? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, worst case, you lose your car, not your house. No. Oh. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from anyone else? Because I'm conscious we are running out of time fairly soon. I was wondering something, because are project developers so powerful in the UK? Uh, that might be a question to answer by actual colleagues in environment agency. So what it, what is it like dealing with developers in the UK? Well, I mean, in my in my experience, um, with the EA now, I'm, I'm local local authority background, it's, it can be a nightmare. Um, because they go, they can do what they want then. Um, well, but the question of viability always always comes up. So if if a local authority is trying to request something that uh, basically makes the development unviable in the opinion of the um, of the developer. Mm -hmm. And you know, they go off and uh, get the um, county to the surveyor to uh, uh, come up with a, uh, a judgment on whether or not uh, uh, the local authority is acting um, uh, out of um, kilter with uh, with the requirement. Then yeah, they can they can be quite uh, awkward. I mean, let's mm -hmm. put it that, that let's put it that way. So you know, they certainly in the past, developers uh, promise an, an awful lot in their um, Initial development plans, but by the time you've actually they've actually gone through all the processes and they've, they've had to take all the the considerations like schooling and etc. etc. Because uh, in, the the, what, in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, the the developers are basically outlined by our zoning plans. Right. Okay. Well, and perhaps, perhaps, but I mean, whether or not uh, I, I think there could be a central government thing in the sense of perhaps we're moving towards. Uh, making it uh, easier for uh, developers to develop uh, rather than actually controlling what does get developed tightly. That's my opinion. Yeah, I, I sort of reiterate that point that we as an uh, agent or we as a local authority um, can veto or put stipulations in the planning, but if developers don't like it, they go to central government to go for an override and normally they get what they want. I don't think we, they can do it with us, these things. That's because the 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 say that the local governments are the decisive uh, body. So yeah. Well, I, I'm all I'm all with you. I think that's what we should be doing. But um, be, you know, because uh, uh, basically the local authority should have the, the vision to um, direct development uh, that's required. That doesn't um, prevent uh, developers developing in a certain way that uh, that they want to. But the actual overall philosophy mm. and strategy should be local authority led. Unfortunately, the developers go to appeal and 
then you scuppered really. Mm. Yep. And also the national government have a massive target on local authorities to develop more housing. So at the end of the day, the government goes, well, we need more housing. They're mm. going to develop it. We could be here all day talking about this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a mute point. So, yeah, I mean, this is some of the stuff that Gary was doing from MAT, looking at the history of the area. So actually it used to be quite a soft area with very much raised dikes and big beaches. And now we're in a situation where we've got uh, probably only 100 metres of soft dike defence left. Everything else now is um, proper sea defence, standard grey infrastructure with historical quick fire batteries, as you can see in the picture there, just behind the seawall. So the comparison between the natural state and what we've done past the 1950s has made a massive impact on the local area. Uh, any questions from anyone else? Just conscious that Rob was supposed to be here, but he's having some massive issues with his iPad. We'll see if I, I had a, another quick one. That's all right. Yeah, go for it, Grant. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned, or possibly in the last one, that, that, that there was mention of the local plan. And just because just we we're on the subject of development, I'm, I'm fairly new to, to, to sort of planning, but it seems like if you can secure things like that as part of your local plan, it makes it much harder for, for developers to, to kind of skirt around that. So is, is that sort of an intention to, to try and put this, you know, if it's to go forward? put this into the local plan to, to kind of set the yeah, stone. So, yeah. so after this, we're looking in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be having a similar workshop like this with our strategic planning team in order to consult on this, to put this into the local plan. Yeah, okay. great. Which is actually one of the outputs of SARC to come up with um, a new strategy for nature-based solutions moving forwards past the life of the project. Mm. Yeah, it's something positive to come out of uh, come out of this academic exercise. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it's a lot harder for them to kind of skirt around it when it's when it's in an accepted local plan. Yeah, yeah and at the same time, it's also we're just somehow trying to show how you can look at it and how you can go about uh, thinking it through. Um, yeah, so so. I would also be more than happy if they would somehow take the effort to do it themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. So that would be uh, maybe even better. And maybe they come up with something else, which is fine too, but it has the same goals. So. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Right. I think we've only got about a minute left in here. So um, I'd just like to say a thank you to Franze and the team at TU Delft, Vivesh University, the Maritime Archaeological Trust, and also HZ University for doing what's been several months worth of work and probably about seven or eight sessions now. Something, yeah. Uh, something like it. Yeah, you can count the blocks now. Eh? That's the nice. That's the nice thing of working online that you actually have really uh, like that you keep your workshop material neat and tidy in here. But it always gets evolved. lost, yeah. yeah. So something of a benefit from new ways of working. Yeah, absolutely. You can effectively come up with an academic plan in three countries all simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Efficiency. Mm. Now I see Good luck with the plan. It Thank you. Exciting. Thank you. Right, we're at time when we should be finished, roughly, or are we no, we're 20 past, roughly. Um, so unfortunately, we haven't got Rob here to sort of key the development around or the discussion around uh, business models and case writing. But obviously, um, the thing that's quite interesting from this is the way in which we went about the process of actually looking at everything in an ordered process going through. 
which is, I mean, how would you describe that process, Franze? Iterative. <laughs> I think what this, what this to, to, to keep to the topic of the business case, I think what is uh, good to mention also, we discussed it in a lot in former session, that we did something similar for uh, the case of Flushing, Flushinger, where it's also uh, uh, becomes, the line becomes an area development. And if you look at the business case, that's what we, in a paper, we wrote a paper about this, what you see in infrastructure projects where you basically maybe heighten a dike or uh, put in a road or whatever, it's very, fairly simple. You have costs and benefits. You build the road or the dike and you prevent, the benefits are the prevention of damage and deaths. Uh, but of course, if it becomes an area development, it becomes much, much more, much more complex. Plus in area development, when we make decisions about redesigning an, 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 a piece of town, then the effects are very important because the effects are about that people enjoy living there, that they have uh, the right amenities, that they're healthy, uh, clean air, etc. So then you can see that the inclusion of effects uh, in comparison to a very straightforward, simple calculation, cost benefit for infrastructure are two different worlds. And that is what we need. That is also something that we need to work towards. And this is, yeah, this is also we see our, our hydraulic engineering colleagues they can come up with the proof very easily. They put up, ah, this is uh, this is what it will cost because they have the numbers and this is what the, the benefits are. And then, and we're like, oh, you know, we, we cannot be so quantitative. We can only be qualitative about, about, about what it will bring about this project. So these kind of differences is also about, yeah, ac accepting, uh, accepting this in the end. Excellent, um, got a question from David. Um, yeah, I just had a thought, um, since you mentioned the measurements of the benefits, uh, which are very difficult to, to quantify, um, do you think that there is any merit in using uh, kind of national capital accounting, actually trying to attach an economic value to ecosystem services, and then maybe use that as a, as a way to approach the developers, because they understand monetary value far easier, even though it might not be the most scientific way in all cases well that's already been done of course for years that's how ecosystem services came about and uh, I'm, I'm i'm personally opposed to the to the concept and i'm using ecosystem participation because it's not about what can nature do for us but how can we participate better with nature i think um but in area development as a field it's generally accepted that you are not able to quantify everything and uh, in those projects, they take steps. So they decide for the project because they can see a balance, even though they don't know exactly what the balance will be. And the further the project is developed, the, the more clear there is on what are the costs and what are the benefits. And benefits are, are qualitative benefits, mm -hmm. almost always, uh, next to, of course, the sales of real estate. So I think that in that field, it is quite common to work like this. So it's basically about in this field, integrating flood defense and in flood defense, trying to step out of this very uh, rigid way of making cost benefit analysis and, and, and include more, uh, uh, yeah, more um, uh, fuzziness, basically. So, so yeah, and yeah, in that, yeah, you, you do not and and doing because I also have a lot of students, of course, comparing options and they're like, yeah, we're going to quantify everything and then see what the best option is. In the end, it, it, the costs and benefits, they, they, it's, it's about where the decision maker wants to put their money. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to put your money, in, yeah, the, the, you know it yourself. If you want to put your money in your house or your car, you know, that's just how you want to present yourself or what, what you enjoy. So At the end, it's, a, it's an emotional decision in a lot exactly. of cases. Exactly, yeah. yeah, and you I, can I quanti you, <laughs> you can quantify it to death, but it, it, yeah. it does, yeah, that that does that doesn't that doesn't really uh, is not it, um, yeah, that is not the 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 main motivation, yeah. Mm. 